Hello and welcome to part two of our three-part video series on crafting the cytopathology report. In part one, we talked about who we are writing the report for, components of a pathology report, and aspects of gross description. In this part, part two, we will cover microscopic description. Part three, which is a separate video, will cover diagnosis and comments. In describing microscopic features, it is helpful to have a system to follow. So for example, for myself, I tend to just be very logical and go with low power findings, which include cellularity and architectural patterns, followed by high magnification findings, which focuses on cytomorphology, for example, the cell shape, the nuclear and cytoplasmic features, and then to include other relevant features, for example, in the context of a malignancy, prognostic features such as nuclear pleomorphism, necrosis, mitosis, and important negatives. Important negatives really depends on the specimen type, and this is an active attempt at answering the specific clinical question at hand. And it's also important to include relevant background material for example, granular proteinaceous material or mucin in cystic lesions. Also, if we see cholesterol crystals, this usually indicates that we may be dealing with a cystic lesion and the presence of inflammatory cells, etc. If non-lesional tissue is present, personally, I also tend to include it for completeness of the report. Here is an example of how cellularity can be very concisely reflected. For example, hypocellular smears show, or moderately cellular, hemodilated hypocellular smears, etc. I just want to highlight that in some contexts, smears can be highly cellular and still non-diagnostic. For example, here we have an EUS-guided FNA of a pancreatic mass. And although the smear is very cellular, this actually only shows normal pancreatic parenchyma and if this is the only finding, then the sample is actually non-diagnostic. In terms of architectural patterns, here is a list of some terms that can be used. This is, of course, not an exhaustive list. We have dispersed cells, aggregates or loosely grouped cells, clusters, cells which are more cohesive and arranged in small groups, acinar formations, rosettes, microfollicles, honeycomb sheets, also flat sheets, syncytial sheets, crowded disorganized sheets, and fascicles. Let's look at some examples. And here we have an example of dispersed cells. This is a lymphoma and often hematolymphoid cells are discohesive and this is reflected in this picture. Here is an aspirate of a pancreatic mass, and we can describe these formations as rosettes. This is quite a classical finding in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. This is an aspirate from another pancreatic mass, and this can be described as a crowded, disorganized sheet. We can see that the nuclei are disorganized with some being close to each other, overlapping each other, and others being further apart. This is a classical example of pancreatic ductal adenocea. In contrast, this is a honeycomb sheet, and often we see this in contaminant gastrointestinal epithelium. As again, you can see here in a pancreatic FNA, this is a honeycomb sheet of contaminant duodenal epithelium. Here is a comparison of what I would describe as aggregates, where you can see that the cells are still discohesive, but they are quite close together. Whereas here we have clusters where the cells are truly cohesive. And this is an example of a lymph node featuring metastatic nasopharyngeal carcinoma, undifferentiated type. And this can be described as a syncytial sheet. In syncytial sheets, we can see the lesional cells forming a sheet. However, the cytoplasmic outlines are ill-defined, so we can't really see where one cell ends and the neighboring cell starts. 
Now moving on to high power, we start with some of the descriptive terms we can use for nuclei. For example, the localization, is it eccentric or are the nuclei central? The nuclear shape, size, degree of pleomorphism, membrane irregularity, chromatin pattern, is it fine, is it even, is it granular, coarse, clumped? Any other distinguishing features, for example, nuclear grooves or pseudo-inclusions? Cytoplasmic features, including the amount of cytoplasm, texture, is it bubbly, dense, vacuolated, delicate, granular, ill-defined, etc., and also the color. In this picture, we can describe these lesional cells as exhibiting central hyperchromatic to pycnotic irregular nuclei with moderately abundant dense eosinophilic cytoplasm. Now we come to important negatives, and this really depends on knowing the clinical question. For example, in the context of a lymph node, the top differentials would include a reactive lymph node, specific infections, or malignancy, more commonly metastatic malignancy. Hence, some of the standard negatives that I include would be necrosis, granulomas, and epithelial cells. Here is a list of relevant negatives that I tend to use in my reports. And again, this is not a prescriptive list. It is just some features that I include in order to try to help to answer the clinical question. In the context of lymph nodes, as I mentioned earlier, whether there is necrosis, granulomas, or epithelial cells, and if they are not present, I will just say that they are not seen. In a thyroid nodule, whether or not colloid is seen, and of course, the amount of colloid. In a salivary gland nodule, especially in solid nodules, where the matrix material is seen. And in a salivary gland or pancreatic cystic lesion, whether or not mucin is present. And particularly in the pancreas, whether the mucin is thick or thin. In a lung mass with malignant cells, especially if I do not have material for ancillary testing or there is no accompanying biopsy, then to mention if SNR formations are present or keratinization is seen, because the investigation and management for adeno CA may not be the same as that for squamous cell carcinoma. And in the breast, to mention if bare bipolar nuclei are noted in the background, because the presence of these is often associated with benign breast lesions. Here is an example of very thick mucin in a pancreatic cystic lesion, and this appearance is already by itself highly suggestive of a neoplastic mucinous cyst, for example, IPMN or MCN, mucinous cystic neoplasm, even if we do not see epithelial cells. Here is a sample report of a thyroid nodule, so we have reflected cellularity architecture, cytomorphological features, specific diagnostic features, background material, and any relevant negatives. Here is an example of a report from a lymph node aspirate, again, cellularity, architecture, cytomorphological features, other relevant diagnostic features, important negatives, and usually if I don't see malignant cells, I would include this line, no malignant cells seen in a report where I have definitive diagnostic findings. Good habits, when findings are only focally seen, it is helpful and considerate to state the relevant pass and the slight number. For example, most of the diagnostic material is seen in the third pass with the slight number stated or a rare samoma body, just a focal finding is identified in which particular slide. This really facilitates review for multidisciplinary team meetings. 
I also tend to describe the cell blocks separately from the smears because, first of all, some architectural features are more apparent in the cell block, and secondly, I find it useful to give a rough indication of the volume of lesional tissue, whether it is sparse, moderately abundant, abundant, because just by reading my report, I can actually have some information to tell the oncologist in terms of facilitating additional downstream ancillary testing. Hence, in summary, it is good to have a system of reporting so that we make sure that our reports are complete. For example, our low power findings, cellularity and architecture, high power findings, cytomorphology, background material and important negatives. And usually, at least for me, I tend to describe the cell block separately. So we have covered in this section microscopic description and in the next part, part 3, we will look at diagnosis and comments. I would like to also invite you to check out PathWeb, which is our free online pathology resource. Registration is completely free. The link is in the video description. We have a virtual pathology museum with more than 1,000 annotated, fully interactive pathology specimens and also lots of interactive elements. Thank you.